Fantastic. Well, should we, uh, should we make a start? My name is David Kellner. I'm a partner and head of research at MMC Ventures. Uh, we're a London-based venture capital firm that invests in Europe's leading and most exciting early-stage technology companies. Um, really excited to have some time today uh, with Timo Bolt, founder and CEO of Gusto. Uh, today, I think the UK's largest uh, direct-to-consumer meal company. Now, we first invested in Gusto uh, in 2012, actually, and uh, you've grown revenues more than 50-fold since then, but uh, still actually very early in your journey. But to me, what's really interesting and unique about what Gusto have done is how they've been applying artificial intelligence to achieve differentiated and genuinely extraordinary results. And I thought over the next few minutes, we, we could chat a little bit about that. Um, but let's, let's just begin with the basics. Um, Timo, for the benefit of the audience, tell us a little bit about the, the Gusto service. What, what do you guys do and kind of what's your scale today? Um, so Gusto is a data company that happens to trade in food. Um, what we do is uh, you choose whatever you like to eat and we send you all the ingredients and exact portions. You still have to cook, but we aim to make your life easier, better and more healthy. Um, and over the last couple of years, we globally have built the best value proposition in, in, in terms of price, choice, convenience, and so on. Um, so that's roughly, roughly what we do. Perfect. And can you give us a sense of just the scale of the business today? Are we talking thousands of meals or, you know? So we're doing roughly 25 million uh, meals across all of the UK. Um, my, my, my view is uh, a billion meals are eaten on a weekly basis. Um, it's literally a billion in just the UK market. It's 64 million people, seven days a week, lunch and dinner. It's, it's phenomenally large, and 82% of those meals are cooked on a daily basis. So if you live in London, you, know, you order pizza and you go to, uh, to takeaway places, but this is not how the world is eating. Um, so it's an absolutely enormous um, uh, size. Um, we're crossing uh, the, the chasm to 100 million plus in revenues. Um, to just give you kind of a sense for, for size. Super. Now, the... The market for recipe kit delivery is, is a crowded one. What is different about what you guys do? So a couple of points. One, again, I think this is day one. The, the mm. size of this market is astronomical in just one country. Um, but what, what our obsession is, um, and my, my humble opinion is overnight success takes 10 years, is we're, we're taking literally a 10-year view on this and, and we're building capabilities no one else in the world is building around AI and technology so that we can build a value proposition uh, to the customer that's uh, far, far, far better to anyone in the, in, in, in the market, um, but also to what we, what we do today, and that then builds a moat um, around the castle. And to just give you a couple of data points, um, you know, we offer 30 meals on a weekly basis. Uh, AI is pretty much uh, selling 40% of recipes, so there's complete personalization. Um, we offer seven days a week delivery, evening, morning slots. Um, we, we, we do pretty much um, half the price point of uh, the large competitors we have, um, while it's trading on a higher margin, which um, we'll, I'm sure we'll go into detail. But um, so we, we obsessed about how do we apply AI to the business model when we were five people uh, in my living room. Uh, the first uh, data scientist joined us. Uh, in 2012, um, I have a lovely wife who works in neuroscience and she kind of pushed me hard to introduce uh, data science at a, at a very early stage. So everything we do is set up for purpose um, and we apply AI um, to three areas of IP. The first one is personalization. So you should really not see what I'm eating on my menu. Uh, in fact, no one should see what, what anyone else is eating. No one in the world has done this um, and we're seeing the metrics um, and it's starting to pay compounding dividends. Um, secondly, we're applying AI um, to the factory and to automation. So we build a supply chain that trades on the lowest food waste in, in, the, in the industry, um, and therefore has massive impact. Um, but we've also seen our labor costs fall off a cliff, come down by 70% in the last 2.5 years. And every single time a data scientist aged 26 uh, does an update to the algorithm, the, the labor cost is falling down which is completely weird to people working in a factory because um, that's not what, what they've, they've seen in the past. And then the third area of IP um, is linking our personalization and automation via forecasting. So a ton of uh, effort has gone into forecasting so that we can 
dramatically reduce lead time to the customer while safeguarding the, the zero percent uh, waste component. So, so if I look at, you know, the question was crowded, crowded marketplace, in my very humble opinion, if I fast forward by five years, I don't see anyone in our industry compete in the next five years. And this is not, I'm not being cocky or arrogant or an a-hole. I'm, I'm literally looking at the differences in strategies. And if your strategy is sell, sell, sell this business, right, to whoever buys it the quickest, you acquire customers at a, at a very high uh, uh, rate, uh, and you're not building capabilities. And we just obsess about capabilities. And for years and years, uh, every other VC fund has told us it's a horrible strategy. It won't pay out. Um, now, today, we, we've raised less than 10% of what the big competitors have raised, but we're trading at a higher market cap. So something is clearly working out. And, and so we're quite optimistic about the future. Perfect. And just to dig in briefly, the, the data science capability you described, some of the benefits you got in terms of personalization, supply chain. Just give us a few metrics around either the product proposition or hard business metrics about what AI is delivering for you? Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, you have to link it back to revenues and EBITDA. We, we are quite commercial. But if you kind of break this down and you unpick it and you look at, for example, personalization, personalization directly impacts cost of acquisition, retention rate, conversion rate, which drives down um, um, uh, cost, cost per acquisition. Uh, and then on the other side, um, your AOV is getting up. The, the more you can customize and personalize the value proposition, the more you drive up uh, your, your AOV, your average basket, and, and obviously there's a huge uh, margin component. Um, we're smaller than uh, supermarkets, obviously, um, but the leverage we get on, on margin is, is phenomenal, thanks, thanks to AI. Cool. Now, you talked a bit about how some of your more direct competitors you know, maybe are, are struggling without this advantage, but how might traditional kind of supermarkets respond to this? Can they deploy the same kind of capability over time and you maybe use their scale to, to make life difficult for you? So, so we're benefiting from four mega trends in the world, health, sustainability, convenience, and online. And for the last 50 years, supermarkets have built a supply chain that for the next 50 years is no longer fit for purpose. Um, customers, consumers, we, you, I want to be on a bus or on a, in a taxi and we want to click on pictures and we want to get stuff delivered instantly. Um, so, so the whole concept of me, my son, in 18 years, when he's 18, going to the supermarket and, and, and carrying home stuff and is, is completely ridiculous. So that's point one, um, so not fit for purpose. Point two is, I obviously, um, I mean, I'm a humble person and I look at um, best practice in, in the supermarket world. It's a 200 billion uh, pound industry. 55% of every pound you spend is, is spent on, on groceries, uh, roughly. But what's fascinating is none of the CEOs uh, in, in the UK from all the big supermarkets can tell you in real time what's in the shop, right? It takes them on average 48 hours to just know if they're out of yogurt or bananas, and then that's what they're focusing on. And you know, without naming people, but two of the largest supermarkets are running three, four-year uh, projects to change their ERP system so that they have real-time data. So I think once they start to focus on AI, you know, that's 2023, and then we can start about, you know, start discussing how they apply this to our market. But it's it's so fascinating how big this industry is but like how no one has the capabilities to actually start. Super, we've got just less than a minute left. Um, let's look longer term. Tell me a bit about how you think Gusto might evolve more broadly in the kind of next phase of its life over the years ahead. Well, I think we're, we're at this like um, inflection point where we have to take a decision whether we become multi-brand and we launch different brands um, as some of the competition have done or if we, become, if we try to become the Netflix of, of kind of food and we become one platform, to me, letter is far better um, because we, we fully leverage our capabilities to the absolute maximum. And the opportunity I see is, is uh, I mean, this is our secret strategy, but it's, uh, you know, it's convenience, choice, and customization, pushing those massive levers with the capabilities we've built. And then you might wake up and you see a totally different proposition and you all of a sudden see how we become a healthcare company in a couple of years. This sounds tantalizing. I would love to hear more. Unfortunately, we're out of time. But Thanks thank very, you much. very much. Cheers. Cheers.